The Abolition of Man, Chapter 1, Part 2 But it is not only Gaius and Tidia. In another little book, whose author I will call Orbilius, I find that the same operation, under the same general anesthetic, is being carried out. Orbilius chooses for debunking a silly bit of writing on horses, where these animals are praised as the willing servants of the early colonists in Australia. And he falls into the same trap as Gaius and Titius. Of Rush and Slipnir, and the weeping of horses of Achilles, and the war horse in the book of Job, nay, even a Br'er Rabbit and a Peter Rabbit, of man's prehistoric piety to our brother the ox, of all that this semi-anthropomorphic treatment of beasts has meant in human history, and of the literature where it finds noble or piquant expression, he has not a word to say. Even of the problems of animal psychology as they exist for science, he says nothing. He contents himself with explaining that horses are not secundum literum, interested in colonial expansion. This piece of information is really all that his pupils get from him. Why the composition before them is bad when others that lie open to the same charges are good, they do not hear. Much less do they learn of the two classes of men who are, respectively, above and below the dangers of such writing. The man who really knows horses and who really loves him, not with anthropomorphic illusion, but with ordinate love, and the irredeemable urban blockhead to whom a horse is merely an old-fashioned means of transport. Some pleasure in their own ponies and dogs they will have lost. Some incentive to cruelty or neglect they will have received. Some pleasure in their own knowingness will have entered their minds. That is their day's lesson in English, though of English they have learned nothing. Another little portion of the human heritage has been quietly taken from them before they were old enough to understand. I have hitherto been assuming that such teachers as Gaius and Titius do not fully realize what they are doing and do not intend the far-reaching consequences it will actually have. There is, of course, another possibility, what I have called presuming on their concurrence in a certain traditional sense of values, the trousered ape and the urban blockhead may be precisely the kind of man they really wish to produce. The differences between us may go all the way down. They may really hold that the ordinary human feelings about the past or animal or large waterfalls are contrary to reason and contemptible and ought to be eradicated. They may be intending to make a clean sweep of traditional values and start with a new set. That position will be discussed later. If it is the position which Gaius and Titius were holding, I must, for the moment, content myself with pointing out that it is a philosophical and not a literary position. In filling their book with it, they have been unjust to the parent or headmaster who buys it and who has got the work of amateur philosophers where he expected the work of professional grammarians. A man would be annoyed if his son returned from the dentist with his teeth untouched and his head crammed with the dentist's obiter dicta, or bimetallism, or the Baconian theory. But I doubt whether Gaius and Titius have really planned, under cover of teaching English, to propagate their philosophy. I think they have slipped into it for the following reasons. In the first place, literary criticism is difficult, and what they actually do is very much easier. To explain why a bad treatment of some basic human emotion is bad literature is, if we exclude all question-begging attacks on the emotion itself, a very hard thing to do. Even Dr. Richards, who first seriously tackled the problem of badness in literature, failed, I think, to do it. To debunk the emotion on the basis of a commonplace rationalism is within almost anyone's capacity. In the second place, I think Gaius and Titius may have honestly misunderstood the pressing educational need of the moment. They see the world around them swayed by emotional propaganda. 
they have learned from tradition that youth is sentimental. And they conclude that the best thing they can do is to fortify the minds of young people against emotion. My own experience as a teacher tells an opposite tale. For every one pupil who needs to be guarded from a weak excess of sensibility, there are three who need to be awakened from the slumber of cold vulgarity. The task of the modern educator is not to cut down jungles, but to irrigate deserts. The right difference against false sentiments is to inculcate just sentiments. By starving the sensibility of our pupils, we only make them easier prey to the propagandist when he comes. For famished nature will be avenged and a hard heart is no infallible protection against a soft head. But there is a third and a profounder reason before the procedure which Gaius and Titius adopt. They may be perfectly ready to admit that a good education should build some sentiments while destroying others. They may endeavor to do so, but it is impossible that they should succeed. Do what they will, it is the debunking side of their work, and this side alone, which will really tell. In order to grasp this necessity clearly, I must digress for a moment to show that what may be called the educational predicament of Gaius and Titius is different from that of all their predecessors. Until quite modern times, all teachers and even all men believed the universe to be such that certain emotional reactions on our part could be either congruous or incongruous to it. Believed, in fact, that objects did not merely receive, but could merit our approval or disapproval, our reverence or our contempt. The reason why Coleridge agreed with the tourist who called the cataract sublime and disagreed with the one who called it pretty was, of course, that he believed inanimate nature to be such that certain responses could be more just or ordinate or appropriate to it than others. And he believed, correctly, that the tourists thought the same. The man who called the cataract sublime was not intending simply to describe his own emotions about it. He was also claiming that the object was one which merited those emotions. But for this claim, there would be nothing to agree or disagree about. To disagree with, this is pretty, if those words simply describe the lady's feelings, would be absurd. If she had said, I feel sick, Coleridge would hardly have replied, No, I feel quite well. When Shelley, having compared the human sensibility to an Aeolian lyre, goes on to add that it differs from a liar in having a power of internal adjustment, whereby it can accommodate its chords to the motions of that which strikes them, he is assuming the same belief. Can you be righteous, asked Tahern, unless you be just in rendering to things their due esteem? All things were made to be yours, and you were made to prize them according to their value. St. Augustine defines virtue as ordo amortis, the ordinate condition of the affections in which every object is accorded that kind and degree of love which is appropriate to it. Aristotle says that the aim of education is to make the pupil like and dislike what he ought. When the age for reflective thought comes, the pupil who has been thus trained in ordinate affections or just sentiments will easily find the first principles in ethics. But to the corrupt man, they will never be visible at all, and he can make no progress in that science. Plato before him said the same. The little human animal will not at first have the right responses. It must be trained to feel pleasure, liking, disgust, and hatred at those things which really are pleasant, likable, disgusting, and hateful. In the Republic, the well-nurtured youth is one who would see most clearly whatever was amiss in ill-made works of man or ill-grown works of nature, and with a just distaste would blame and hate the ugly even from his earliest years, and would give delightful praise to the beauty, receiving it in his soul and being nourished by it, so that he becomes a man of gentle heart. All this before he is of an age to reason, so that when reason at length comes to him, then bred as he has been, he will hold out his hands in welcome and recognize her because of the affinity 
he bears to her. In early Hinduism, that conduct in men which can be called a good consists in conformity to, or almost participation in, the rata, that great ritual or pattern of nature and supernature, which is revealed alike in the cosmic order, the moral virtues, and the ceremony of the temple. Righteousness, correctness, order, the rata, is constantly identified with satya, or truth, correspondence to reality. As Plato said that the good was beyond existence, and Wordsworth, that though virtue, the stars were strong, so the Indian masters say that the gods themselves are born of the rata and obey it. The Chinese also speak of a great thing, the greatest thing, called Tao, or Tao. It is the reality beyond all predictions, the abyss that was before the Creator Himself. It is nature, it is the way, the road. It is the way in which the universe goes on, and the way in which things everlastingly emerge, stilly and tranquil, into space and time. It is also the way which every man should tread in imitation of that cosmic and supercosmic progression, conforming all activity to that great exemplar. In ritual, say the Analects, it is harmony with nature that is prized. The ancient Jews likewise praise the law as being true. Thus, conception in all its forms, Platonic, Aristotelian, Stoic, Christian, and Oriental alike, I shall henceforth refer to it for brevity simply as the Tao. Some of the accounts of which I have quoted will seem, perhaps to many of you, merely quaint or even magical. But what is common to them all is something we cannot neglect. It is the doctrine of objective value, the belief that certain attitudes are really true and others really false, to the kind of thing the universe is and the kind of things we are. Those who know the Tao can hold that to call children delightful or old men venerable is not simply to record a psychological fact about our own parental or familial emotions at the moment, but to recognize a quality which demands a certain response from us whether we make it or not. I myself do not enjoy the society of small children. Because I speak from within the Tao, I recognize this is a defect in myself. Just as a man may have to recognize that he is tone deaf or colorblind. And because our approvals and disapprovals are thus recognitions of objective value or responses to an objective order, therefore emotional states can be in harmony with reason when we feel liking for what ought to be approved, or out of harmony with reason when we perceive that liking is due but cannot feel it. No emotion is in itself a judgment. In that sense, all emotions and sentiments are illogical. But they can be reasonable or unreasonable as they conform to reason or fail to conform. The heart never takes the place of the head, but it can and should obey it. And we'll pause here and continue with this chapter in the next video. Please like, subscribe if you haven't. Leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you guys. I love you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.